Thank you. <clears throat> I have no disclosures, uh, except that I have a private clinic, um, the only one in Denmark. I wish it would be within the public system, but that's not so this far. We're still working on it. But um, I have a lot of patients, and when you have patients, first of all, you hear a lot from the patients, and like Ron Davis said yesterday, you have to listen to your patients when they tell you what works and what does not work. Um, so that's one thing. You also have an obligation to treat your patients because when they are that sick, as, as Jonas talked about, you are obliged to do something about it. So uh, what my ambition is, is to make a first a Scandinavian consensus on how to treat these patients and then hopefully a European consensus and then we'll be in touch with the Americans and see if we can get sort of global, I don't know if we can reach that, but, but that would be something that we could go forward with. Oops, that's the old version I can see, whatever. <clears throat> so, as you know, there's no approved medication for a patient with ME-CFS, and we can't cure ME-CFS. But symptomatic treatment could, of course, be applied. And as you've heard through the days, there's a lot of knowledge about bi the pathobiology of ME-CFS. So, using that knowledge in the symptomatic treatment seemed to be a rational course. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, this one I've stolen from Gottschalk. Um, it shows what we already have heard, that the virus is back. And this is a picture of the Epstein-Barr virus infecting a B cell. And it, it has had a latency of possibly several years. When it's activated, it causes inflammation. And what can we do about that? Most patients have no inflammation. They have cognitive dysfunction. They have headaches. They have migraines. Um, so they have all the signs of neuroinflammation. And the obvious thing would be to remove the Epstein-Barr virus. And we know that we cannot remove it totally, but we can treat patients with some of the antiviral medications. And in, at least in Denmark, this is the only one that's available. It's either acyclovir or valacyclovir because the others are too expensive. You can't, they are about 50 times as expensive as the other ones, so we can't use those, which is unfortunate because one of the better studies have been done on valgancyclovir and we would like to use things that have been documented. The other thing you can do is you can try to reduce the inflammation and it was the, uh, a uh, British no uh, Nobel laureate, James, Sir James Black, who said once that if you're looking for a new medication, try the old ones first. So this is what we've done. We've looked at old medications that could perhaps affect neuroinflammation. And the first one is an example of this. This is doxycycline in a low dose, slow release, which is used for treating acne. But it has the good effect that it transverses the blood-brain barrier and it works as an anti-inflammatory drug in the brain. So I had uh, two students in my clinic look at 350 patients that received this drug and they found that 65% of them had an improved effect, uh, improvement in their condition. So that's why we still work with that. We have lots of information on LDN. We do not have any controlled studies. We have information on Abilify primarily from Stanford. We do not, unfortunately, have the clinical control study. And so it goes on down the line here. So there are opportunities to treat neuroinflammation. And it's not like one size fits all. So we have to find the right drug to the right patients. The next point I'd like to make is that we know a lot about mitochondrial dysfunction. You've heard a lot about it today. Uh, what we know is that there's a problem with um, pyruvate, so we instead may use fatty acids. We produce reactive oxygen species, and what can we do about those? Well, we can treat the with antioxidants to remove or to 
balance out the pro-oxidants against the antioxidants. They can use L-carnitine, which will promote the flux of uh, fatty acids into the mitochondria. We can do, we can use D-ribose, which is a pentacarbal, um, carb uh, well, there are five carbon um, atoms in there, uh, so it doesn't go through this pyruvate dehydrogenase, and it can give the patient some more energy. Um, we can use ketogenic amino acids that go through this process up here, following the fatty acids. So there are dietary supplements that we can use for that. And if we go further in, then we have the electron transport chain here. And one of the keys, or two of the keys factors in here is the NAD plus and the coenzyme Q10 that we can use as a dietary supplement. If we go into the gastrointestinal dysfunction, which is not my speciality, but Simon's, uh, but I know that we have to treat patients and some will have obstipation, some will have diarrhea, and others will have dysbiosis. And what we can do about that is we can make dietary adjustments. That is always the first thing that we try. We can then use prokinetics in order to stimulate the move, bowel movement. One is pure distigmin, which may have a lot of other beneficial effect in these patients. We should avoid using opioids or anticholinergics because they will stop the, the movement of the bowel. And if we look at diarrhea, it's also, again, we try with dietary adjustments. We look whether they have bile acid uh, reabsorption problems, and if they have that, then we treat that. Uh, you can use opioids or anticholinergica uh, in order to reduce the bowel movement. For the dysbiosis, we can use probiotics. Um, we do not have any control studies yet. I know that there's one going on in Sweden, and hopefully it will come out at some point in time. And then there's the fecal transplantation that's a promising new thing with the Neptune, was it? Uh, <laughs> the new product. And then this is more like my area, the cardiovascular control. I worked with that for about 40 years uh, before I got into the ME. And what always makes me curious is that when you look at the autonomic nervous system, there's always one that's only this uh, uh, arrow going out from the brain. And we t tend to forget that there is an afferent system that is very important. We know that from the gastrointestinal <coughs> reflex or the neuroinflammatory <coughs> reflex that it is very important that there's a lot of communication between the intestines and the brain. Um, and so we have to have a focus on the different parts of the autonomic nervous system and the different organs that are involved in blood pressure regulation. So if we start over here, we, if we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system with these antibodies that we find, uh, you increase the frequency and contraction, you can get POTS. And if you can get POTS, you can also faint because if the um, time between beats gets shorter and shorter, so at some point the uh, walls of the ventricle will touch each other and you will elicit what is called the Betzeliaris reflex, which means that you faint. It's nature's way of telling you to lie down because your heart is not full enough. Um, it also has an effect on contractility and some people would have the feeling that they have palpitations or they feel their heartbeat much stronger. It's not because it's faster, but it's because the contraction is so much stronger that they really f have the feeling of having palpitations. Sometimes we see increased automaticity, and of course we can treat that. So, for example, beta blocker is something that I use a lot, not to all patients, because the side effect of beta blockers is, is fatigue, so we don't want too much of that. Uh, but there are other ways of treating this. Um, it's important to control the short-term blood pressure regulation because, as you know, a lot of patients have POTS. We've heard about that today. And there are ways of treating this. We can use pyrostigmin. We can sort of enhance the uh, 
parasympathetic nervous system and we can block the sympathetic nervous system and we can increase the contraction of the peripheral vessels so, and we can increase the amount of salt in water, which is very important because often this part is forgotten and we know that the sympathetic nervous system controls the proximal tubule reabsorption of salt and water is where 80% of the salt and water is reabsorbed in the kidney. And if we have trouble there, if we increase or decrease rather the reabsorption, then we dehydrate the patients. And I have several patients who are on intravenous uh, uh, saline infusions, which does help the severely ill sometimes. So if we look at the treatment options, we have a lot of different things we can do. And these are well-known drugs that are approved and have good um, science behind them. So in summary, we've looked now on neuroinflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, gastrointestinal dysfunction, and cardiovascular control. But those are not the only areas that we have to look at when we're doing a treatment plan. So there are many other things that we can do, fortunately. Um, all these systems are involved both in MECFS and in long COVID often. Uh, I see an increasing number of patients with long COVID in my clinic now. Um, there are several treatment options, as I mentioned, but few of them have been subjected to placebo-controlled randomized control studies. Um, and we really need those, but it's very difficult to find funding, as you probably know. Um, that these drugs are already on the market. There's no interest in them. Uh, there's no money to get from pu pu to uh, get them out there. So that's why I think that we should try through the European ME Clinician Council to get a consensus on what can we do uh, currently, and then we should encourage to get more randomized control trials. I will finish off by saying that many of you may have seen the, a name appearing in several presentations today. It's Christian Sommerfeld. And he's only appeared in the presentation, so now you get a chance to see him and to hear what he is talking about with the FunCap questionnaire. So Christian, would you please take over? and then I'll run and catch the plane. Thank you.